All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to the third session of our five-part series of our webinar, Grow Your Exports, featuring our good friend, Sam Rothschild of Slim Chickens. My name is Jonathan Bricker, and I'm the chair of the Arkansas District Export Council. In my primary role, I work for Regions Bank, located in Bentonville, Arkansas. My banking career started off as an international business development, and now I'm a commercial lender with a focus on commercial and industrial type businesses. Um, lending money is one of my favorite things to do. I want to begin today by thanking our sponsors, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. Uh, without their sponsorship and their support, uh, we wouldn't be able to host and provide these webinars free of charge um, and market them as, as well as we do. So thank you so much to AEDC and AMS. I really appreciate you all being here today. I'm starting to see a lot of the familiar names, but a couple that uh, may or may not know what the deck is. But we are a private nonprofit organization that brings together experienced international business people with potential exporters. Um, each deck member has been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for their real world expertise in international trade. We have a ton of experience among the council. Uh, many different sectors as well. So if there are any questions that we can help you with, please allow us to be your strategic partner. Um, you can think of us as a community of connections within the exporting world. My hope for you today is that you walk away from this webinar with a little bit more confidence in your exporting abilities. And if you don't uh, feel comfortable asking a question here, please reach out to us at exportarkansas.org and we'll have one of our members reach out to you. So these, uh, these Grow Your Export classes are designed to generate questions uh, for you to kind of work through um, on your way to becoming exporters. They're meant to be super high level, um, but a lot of important parts of becoming exporters. So then when you're ready to take that next step, the deck will be here uh, to help you along the way. So our goal is to help you grow your bottom line which would create higher paying jobs within your organization. I'm going to ask that everyone keep themselves muted and either raise your hand or put your question into the chat. Um, that way we don't have any background noise interrupting our speakers. So now I will introduce everyone to your um, moderator this afternoon, Mr. Rudy Ortiz. Rudy is the previous chairman of the deck and the owner of Strategic Business Services, LLC. He helps companies in a wide variety of international businesses and exporting needs. He helps companies with their foreign market entry efforts and is a partner of the Global Market Entry Consultants, which is a global group of market entry experts uh, located in 32 countries. He has an MBA in international business, and he helps uh, with the various export and supply chain related classes for the DEC. Thank you, Rudy, for spearheading all of this, and I'll turn it over to you. Jonathan, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And uh, today we're going to have a, a fantastic class. You know, uh, Sam Rothschild is one of my very favorite people, and uh, he's uh, a guy who has tremendous amounts of experience in international business. Uh, currently, he's, uh, I, I believe, he, he gets uh, so many promotions, I don't know. Uh, today, he's a ch chief operating officer, I think. But uh, it, he's uh, been with uh, Slim Chickens now for a number of years from uh, kind of its early stages. And, and they've gone global there in many, many countries. And he and I were actually having a discussion just a little while ago about all the countries that he's been just in the last couple of weeks. And so he do, does a lot of uh, globe trotting. Uh, he's uh, got at least 25 years of, of international experience. And, and currently, you guys probably already know that Slim Chickens is a is a, a global franchise. And Sam has been a really big part of the reason of the success of, of Slim Chickens. Uh, he has a lot of experience in the, the restaurant business. And uh, he sells uh, franchises. You know, as, as you know, franchises are a, a big buck item. And uh, he makes sure that... That the people uh, are the the right people for the business, and that they're going to be able to to be successful. And he's going to be talking uh, about developing relationships. And at the end of the day, business is about relationships. International business is definitely 
about relationships. And I don't think I, I know of anybody that has a, a better grasp of that and, and how to make that happen uh, than Sam does. And so, Sam, thank you so much for, for taking time to, to talk to about us about uh, uh, developing relationships in, in other countries. And if you'll take it away, appreciate it. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I'll send you the gift cards for all the nice things that you said about Ex me. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, let me see if I can share my screen here now, uh, Heidi. Uh, okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. Look, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam Rothschild. I'm one of the partners at Slim Chickens. I'm uh, the chief strategy officer and the chief international officer. I gave up my chief operating officer title a couple of weeks ago, we promoted uh, uh, one of our wonderful senior VPs of operations into that role. That allows me now to spend more time working on, on the strategic initiatives for Slim Chickens, but really we're, we're gonna put a lot of emphasis on what we're doing uh, internationally. Uh, currently today, um, we are in uh, Ireland, UK, Germany, we just signed Poland. We have a store in an airport in Turkey. I just finished a deal in Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei. Uh, and we are in pretty significant negotiations in many countries in the GCC and also uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, Rudy is correct. In the last two months, I have been to the UK. I've been to Belfast. To, uh, I just came back Saturday from Malaysia. I've been to uh, the Philippines. And um, yeah, I'm out there globetrotting, working it. And when I say working it, one is not only trying to get the deals done, but nurturing um, these relationships that ultimately uh, lead to a deal. So what I'm going to do today is talk you through uh, some tips and tricks on how to do this. Uh, I don't, I'm not one that reads slides, but, you know, I'll put a slide up there to remind me some things I probably should be telling you. Uh, please ask questions at the end um, or raise your hand, uh, as Heidi and, and Rudy said. I prefer a dialogue. I, I like rich questions. So uh, with, with that, uh, I'll get started. Uh, develop customer relationships. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is understanding. Uh, I was told a long time ago, and this kind of stuck with me, I was doing business in, in Central America, and I was getting very frustrated uh, with these people that I were dealing with. They were going very slow. I was having meetings with them, and they could tell I was getting frustrated. And one guy looked at me, and he said, uh, Senor, the one thing you have to understand is you're not in America anymore. He said, we do things the way we do things here. And uh, you should be glad I showed up to the meeting. So for me, that was like a lightning bolt moment um, because we seem to go at a, at a pace um, that's different than other parts of the world. And it, it, it is accurate then and it is accurate today. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about cultural differences. We're gonna talk a little bit about managing customer relationships to get the sale. If you're still thinking about, you, you know, this is your first time trying to get a deal done and then how to really work on the relationships to ultimately get the deal done because a lot of it is based on trust and personal interaction. It's a little easier for me because I'm one of the owners of Slim Chickens. Um, so when people are dealing with me, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my partners and it really helps us um, kind of cement what it is that we're trying to accomplish. It went the wrong way. So there's gonna be four things we're gonna talk about. One, establishing credibility. Two, building your network. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on leveraging the web. And then we'll discuss uh, some of the challenges in international markets. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cultural uh, best practices. I, I would say the majority of the time, the people that I'm dealing with speak English, but there are times that they don't. I'll give you a recent example. I was in Saudi Arabia about three months ago. I'm working with a very large conglomerate 
that are in many different industries, the chairman of the company does not speak English. So they immediately walked me into a room uh, with him after about being in their office for about 30 minutes. They said the chairman would like to meet you, um, sat down. He was a very sincere man, wonderful disposition. You could tell he had a really warm heart. He really wanted to express to me um, that he was glad that I was there, rushed in some tea. We probably had two sips of tea. He had his interpreter. And he basically just wanted to meet me, shake my hand, but he was also looking me dead in the eye to try to figure out whether or not he wanted his company to do business with me. Um, so it was a very interesting exchange for about 30 minutes because I really couldn't speak uh, directly uh, to him. Um, but it really sparked, it ultimately led to an LOI and we're working uh, to try and get a deal done. Um, but that first interaction was critically important. Because I know if that fumbled that, um, that that relationship uh, would have been gone. Um, so when I say genuine and authentic relationships, I spend the initial amount of time talking to the people that I'm dealing with about their culture, about their country, things that are going on. I'll give you an example. I was just in Malaysia last week, and they have a very interesting system of government. They have kings. They have, they have many kings. They have like 15 kings, and that's a, uh, they're on a rotation basis. I won't get into that. Um, and then they have a uh, prime minister, and they have a parliament. They were run by England for a long time. They were colonized. They drive on the wrong side of the road and everything. It's, it's all very interesting. But when I was talking to them about that and just being very curious about how they do things in that country, you spend hours talking about uh, things you try to stay out of politics, but sometimes it's a good way to enter into conversations. And when you're very sincere and authentic about it, um, it starts building that trusting relationship because you're just you're just who you are. Um, and then they start asking questions about you, your company. I spend a lot of time talking about family. Um, a lot of these people that you're dealing business doing business with around the world, they they have very strong family values. Um, and in their family and their business is very important to them. A lot of the people that you might be doing business with, um, they are, sorry, I'm plugging in my battery here. Um, their family uh, businesses that have been going on sometimes for, for second and third generation. And so before I get into the business, I, I just, we really just talk a lot uh, about getting to know each other, what they're passionate about. Um, it's easy to talk about American sports. And then when they start talking about cricket and um, uh, other types of uh, games, I didn't know, but in Malaysia, badminton is huge. I had no idea. So I let them talk about badminton. And I was like, wow, we played that when we were kids, but that's not a sport over here. But have you heard of pickleball? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, no, it, they're starting to get into pickleball over there. Um, but part of that is this eagerness to willing uh, to understand another culture uh, and how they do things all the way down to how they eat uh, and how they drink and whether or not they drink uh, alcohol or not. A lot of these countries, a lot of these people I do business with, they don't drink alcohol. Um, so guess what? When we go to dinner, uh, I'm not ordering a cocktail. So I think all that's very important. You know, sometimes depending on the country, you might want to learn a few sayings, but then again, don't use them unless you know that, that you really think it's going to be something that's pretty cool and that they appreciate you understanding. I usually botch it, but when I traveled Asia uh, a lot back in the 90s, I, you know, I learned some common phrases, but uh, I try to stay away from it. But sometimes it's kind of funny. They look at you and go, well, thanks for trying um, 95% of the people that I'm dealing with speak English, so you don't need to do it. But sometimes uh, I also found out they taught me bad words. Uh, so I'm like, oh, they set you up for, for a big laugh. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you, you kind of, through this interaction and conversation, you really just try to get to know each other as people uh, before you want to do business together. Um, they know you're there for a reason. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, part of my process of selling franchises, they come to the U.S. Um, so this whole thing reciprocates itself. I have a very large business in the U.K. 
Um, and so I have 58 Slim Chickens in the UK. Uh, we have some flagship restaurants in London. These people that I'm doing business with, they're all wealthy people. My deals are multi-million dollar deals with very with people with large checkbooks and a lot of these guys, their families are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. For me to ask them to meet in London, they're always like, heck yeah. Um, so I use London as a place to sell franchises. And then we reciprocate with visits. Sometimes I go to their country before, they meet in London, I go back to their country. Um, it's just a way of things that I do business with. But we spend a ton of time just getting to know each other as human beings. And sometimes I meet their families, I meet their friends. Um, so I can't, I can't stress enough to you that you you gotta you gotta cement this trusting relationship or your deals aren't gonna go anywhere. Uh some some tips and tricks. Look, uh 30 hours just telling Rudy, 30 hours door to door from Kansas City uh to uh Malaysia. Um uh <laughs> I went from Kansas City to Dallas to Doha to Malaysia. When I was in uh, Philippines, I went through Japan. It was easy for me to get to Ireland and the UK, going to the Middle East. It's a 25-hour journey. Zoom kind of works for the follow-up or the initial calls, but you better get ready to pack your bags. And depending on where you're going, as you can tell, I'm globetrotting to the other side of the world. Sometimes, obviously, if you're going to Mexico or Canada, Central America, those are a lot easier. Um, but... I'll tell you, um, Zoom's okay, but if you really want to get things going, you got to show up um, because then they know you're serious about it uh, and you're willing to spend your time, money, and resources to do it. Uh, I stay in top-end hotels. Uh, one, it kind of shows you're serious business people. Uh, two, I'm very concerned about safety. Um, you know, right now there's a lot of things going on in the world. Uh, and in some countries, you know, that I haven't felt threatened at all, but, you know, sometimes there, there is a big anti-American sentiment going on in the Middle East and some parts of Asia. Uh, I was just telling Rudy, 60% of the population in, in Malaysia is Muslim, and they're really not happy with America right now uh, because what's going on uh, in the Middle East. I also stay at a top end hotel. I'll share a story with you um because you need that kind of service and support i did a trip last year where i went to pakistan then to egypt then to saudi and then to dubai i typically have some eating requirements uh when i'm out there which is don't drink the water uh use bottled water uh don't have drinks that have ice in it because that's water and sometimes be careful of the produce if it's coming off the broiler or the deep fat fryer you're pretty in good shape um, but I got really sick, um, from Pakistan flying into Egypt. First time in my life at three o'clock in the morning, I called down to the front desk and said, send me a doctor. Um, I was staying at the Ritz, uh, in Cairo and within 45 minutes, they had a doctor in my room and I was sick for two days. I got, who knows what I got, but this guy was shooting stuff into me as best as he could. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you might want to do that uh, for the extra hundred bucks or 200 bucks a night. And also some of these countries with the exchange rate. I mean, I stayed at the Ritz Carlton in Malaysia in a nice suite for 250 bucks a night <laughs> um, because the exchange rate is so favorable. So please, you know, set yourself up for success. Um, social norms for meals and entertainment. You got to check it out. And oh, by the way, you might have to eat some weird food. Um, and that's okay. Try it. If it looks too weird, just say no, thank you. Um, but you know, uh, like I say, Chinese food in Asia is not the same thing as getting general Tsao chicken, uh, in your local Chinese restaurant. Um, they've got many other different things. Same thing in the, in the Gulf. Um, just learn how to eat a lot of ramen or a lot of lamb and you'll be in good shape. Um, in some countries, they still do a lot of smoking. And if it offends you, suck it up. Um, uh, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, and then it's a really weird thing. Like, who picks up the check? What I have found most recently is they want to pick up the check. And you can't fight over it and offend them. So you just like, for me, I always pick up the check. But, man, they're getting craftier these days. And that's fine. Um, and then, look, uh, I just say be very careful of how you communicate 
uh, Americans tend to be very aggressive uh, in the way we talk sometimes, and it, it doesn't always go over very well. And uh, sarcasm doesn't go anywhere. So if you are a very sarcastic person like I am, um, you have to be very careful because it doesn't translate. You're not that close yet. Uh, there might be a point where you get close enough to where you can start busting on each other. Uh, but in the beginning, uh, just be very careful of how you communicate, what you communicate. Um, and, you know, just be nice and polite. Um, what, I'll, what I'll tell you is in a lot of countries, um, just because they're smiling at you and nodding doesn't mean they're agreeing with you. Um, because that's just kind of their communication style and, and you just have to be able to read the room and read the people that you're dealing with. Um, but you're just going to have to be flexible. And also in some of these countries, you're going to have to be willing to eat dinner at nine o'clock at night. Um, they don't eat at six, seven o'clock. Some of these guys, they eat nine, 10 o'clock at night and they go to one, two in the morning. You're just going to have to learn it. You're going to have to understand it. And you're just obviously going to have to flex and deal with it. Uh, so how do you establish credibility? This is the big thing. So you've gone through the trust part. You're, you're developing a relationship with somebody. And now are you a subject matter expert in what it is that you're trying to do and what you're trying to sell? Um, you got to you got to know your stuff. These, these guys that I deal with, they are very sharp, smart people. And a lot of them, their bullshit meter will peg into the red really quick. Um, so it, and, and it's got to come from the heart. It's got to be passionate. They got to know you're in it to win it. Um, but you have to be very careful. I always, and I do this with my partners. I always under pro, <laughs> under promise and over deliver. Um, I'm just like one of those guys that don't like to be behind. Um, but then you really, you, you really got to do a few things. One, you have your business, you have your business model, you have your product and service that you're trying to sell. Obviously, they're very interested in, in what you have to sell. Uh, remember this, you're not the only one they're talking to normally. They're probably shopping a few other um, uh, services uh, or whatever it is that you're trying to sell them. Um, and they're now trying to compare you as a business person and a product and offering than the other people they have either may have already talked to or they're in the queue of, of going to talk to somebody. Um, so just really know your business, read the room and try to figure out where their pain points are and what it's going to take to get you to the next meeting uh, or get them to, as I like to say, let them fall in love with your product and let them fall in love with you. Um, because then, you know, you're going to take the lead. Uh, your stuff's got to be quality. They, they, they got to understand, not only do you stand behind your product, but you're really going to have to sell them on the service. You're somewhere else around the world. They're going to buy your product. They want to know how you're going to support it and what you're going to do to continue to foster that relationship with them. They know now when they send you text um, internationally, they use WhatsApp. Uh, they don't use, they very rarely use um, this text. So uh, the text that we use in the U.S. So you have to get on WhatsApp and that's how communication goes. I, I spend more time on WhatsApp than I do emails, which is also kind of nice because when they're using WhatsApp, um, it's a really good way to continue to engage socially. Um, and that's when you can tell you're fostering that relationship Um to to get to the sale if they start ghosting you and then you know there's something wrong um but again it's uh, i just jump backwards a minute that, that's that's critically important but to get to your product they got to know what you're selling is it competitive you're going to service it you're going to take care of their issues you're better than your competitors and you understand how to do business internationally. That is critical, especially for a lot of people that are maybe on this call and you're thinking about going internationally. We have a whole nother um, uh, uh, class about, you know, launching uh, and doing things, but they're trying to figure out, okay, do you actually even know how to do this? 
you're going to have to start um, convincing them that you're going to you you know how to do it. Um, you're going to be able to provide them the training and support um, and the materials they need to be successful. Um, but that's part of some of the things you're really going to have to think about um, because that's all part of establishing your credibility. And you're going to have to train your organization to think through this before you launch. Um, and that's a whole nother series and, and topics. And then if you're attending local trade shows, um, which is like the first step in meeting somebody, um, you typically got to partner up with some people who know these trade shows. We do international trade shows. I have a broker uh, who's handling some business with me in Southeast Asia. He goes to the trade shows, represents me. Sometimes I go. Um, but also those people are very connected uh, to people in the food service industry. So I use brokers to introduce me to potential candidates. And then I hate being in trade show booths, but sometimes you got to cold deck it and shake some hands and, and do some grinning. But, you know, that, that also helps you as well. Um, th this slide is, you know, kind of before or after this one. Now that you got the meeting, that's when you then you start establishing the credibility. Um, uh, as I said in the, in the previous slide, the question for you is um, on this one, which is in red, um, man, you got to be patient. Uh, sometimes it takes me a year to work a deal uh, or longer. Um, worked on a deal in the Middle East. Uh, well, my deal in Malaysia took forever. It took almost a year. One of the things that was very interesting in Malaysia that I hadn't had to deal with in other countries, the government actually had to approve the deal. Uh, so the government got involved and then halfway through the deal and dealing with the government, they decided to change the agency that was approving the deal. So we almost had to start all over again. Um, that's the first time the government, you know, kind of got into my stuff and I'm just trying to open restaurants. Um, but they, they, they want to understand franchise contract law uh, and they want to make sure what they're doing is kind of vetting that we're good people um, from the U.S. They got mine and my partner's passports. They did background checks on us. I guess there's a lot of people that pounce on Malaysia from the Middle East and Asia that maybe be unsavory people. Um, but in other countries as well, I always tell people, look, if you're going to lawyer up, get a lawyer that understands how to do business because the lawyers a lot of times drag down the deals. Um, and also these guys um, in the Middle East in the summer, forget it. Um, they leave in April and they'll see you again in September. Uh, the guys with money all head to Europe where it's nice and cold uh, or us to say maybe 20 degrees cooler. Uh, and then they come back. Then you've got things like Ramadan uh, and you got Chinese New Year. Uh, so between Christmas and like the end of February, there's not a lot of stuff getting done in some of the Asian countries. These are some of the things that you just have to learn and understand. You can't get frustrated. I can get a deal done in the U.S. in about 90 days. Um, but in some of these other countries, man, it just drag you out. And that's fine. At the end of the day, if you know you're going to get a deal, just keep working it. Don't get frustrated, understand how they do things. And because you're in it for the long haul, uh, sometimes you're under pressure in your company to get deals done, um, but that's fine. You're just going to have to set expectations um, as to how that the deal is still progressing, but it might not hit your original target dates of when you think you're going to close it. Yeah, and uh, Sam, if I might provide a little context uh, about why things are done uh, differently in other countries. Uh, you know, it isn't just be just because they, they want to, you know, here in the United States, we, we have the luxury of, of having uh, uh, in courts that, you know, if I, if I have some sort of, some sort of lawsuit, uh, you know, against you, uh, you know, I can fully expect that, you know, the judges and the juries are going to, to look at the facts and they're going to make a determination based on the, on, on those facts, not on the fact that somebody paid you off or, you know, that I paid the other guy off in many, many countries, that is not the case. And so, 
since they cannot count on uh, on the courts for giving a fair judgment, what they use and, and what we're starting to use as well, even in the United States, is the development of relationships so that they can get to know you. That's why they ask you about your kids and your sports and all of that. They want to get to know you as a person to make sure that you're a good guy and to know that if something does go south, and eventually something will, that you're going to take care of it uh, because they cannot count on the courts to make that decision, uh, you know, what was fair, what was not fair. And so that is the reason that the majority of, of countries in, throughout the world use, you know, that's why things go slower. In, in the United States, we're used to, you know, if I'm selling a pump to a guy in Wisconsin, you know, and he tells me, well, the pump has to have these specifications and the cost is right. I can fully expect that I'm going to go over there and I'm going to come back with a contract, right? Because if something does go south, we know it's the, the courts are going to take care of it. That is not the case. Almost, um, uh, you know, I would say 80% of the world. And so that's why they take things slower and develop relationships because they cannot count on their courts to make things right when they go south. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And a lot of it, it what I find is we're going to we we have to find a neutral place for arbitration because um, I'll put, hey, uh, we're going to fight this out in, in Johnson County, Arkansas. And, you know, I'm dealing with somebody in Pickett, Saudi Arabia or or in the, and they're like, no, uh, we want to do it here. And you're like, well, how about we go to, you know, an international country that's unbiased and, and have to arbitrate there? Um, you know, that's on the legal side. Look, for me, I look at legal documents kind of like a prenup, right? <laughs> it's only used when something goes really south. Um, to Rudy's point, it, you know, you, you as the business person should be able to take care of the problem and it should never get there. Um, but it, it does get there. Um uh, and you know, you're just, you're just going to have to deal with it, uh, as it comes. The other thing is, and I've seen this not only in my business and others, the first thing they want to do is do a letter of intent before they get into a contract. Um, so a letter of intent says, yeah, I think I want to do business with you and let's get into kind of a negotiation period. And maybe it's a 30 or 90 day letter of intent that allows you to really negotiate with each other. See if you can get the contracts done um, because the contracts that you use in the, in the U.S., they'd like to take a red line to them. And in some of the countries, actually, you're going to have to change anyway because local laws dictate certain things in your agreements. So to this point, um, just be patient. Learn the system. Uh, look, the other thing is, and Rudy, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, you're going to have to find lawyers that know how to do business in these countries. Yep. Um, I have a good network uh, of, of I have a great U.S. attorney that has global network of, of local counsel that they do business with. So they can at least get me somebody that knows all the country rules and regs. Um, and you're going to have to build that network up if you plan on doing deals in other countries, because they're going to want to redline your agreement, like I said, or they're going to they're going to um, there's some local laws and regulations uh, that have like anti money laundering, anti this, anti that, that need to be specific to their country that they're going to have to add to your agreements. And somebody's going to have to see all that traffic going back and forth. Um, and it can become very expensive if you don't if you have a lawyer that doesn't know what they're doing. So. Uh, building your network, there's some helpful tents, uh, hints for success. I'm sure uh, Heidi can send this out to you. Uh, there's different ways to do some homework um, uh, to get ready to go into these countries. The good news is um, thoroughly investigate the company that you're doing on the Internet. Uh, look up some cultural stuff and, and things that are going on uh, in these countries before you get there. But honestly, just honest, sincere, you know, dialogue about what's going on will, will you know, get you accustomed as to what's going on. And look, uh, I will tell you uh, from the relationship side as well, uh, and this is in one of the other seminars, I spent a lot of time during my vetting process in the countries asking very casual questions to find out about government security, 
currency security, um, uh, how they're feeling about the U.S. I'll, I'll share a story with you real quick. Um, we um, in in Malaysia currently today, uh, there's a pretty large anti-American sediment right now um, because of what's going on in the Middle East. And I may have said this a little bit. So I'm in the food service industry. Um, there were 400 KFCs in Malaysia. There are now only 300 KFCs. A uh, hundred of them had to close because they weren't doing any business. Um, Starbucks is getting pounded um, because what, what's going on over there, and it's actually happening in the GCC. I have some friends in the food service business. They're boycotting with their dollars or with whatever currency they're in. So they're just not using the brand. Um, and they're using local brands or others because they're they're angry with with the geopolitics going on over there. The deal that I just signed over there a couple months ago, we haven't even announced it yet. We're going to wait till later as we get closer to, um, you know, getting a restaurant open probably sometime next year because we don't we don't want any misperceptions or we're hoping that things are going to calm down a little bit um, before, you know, we make any announcement or we just might open and not do a PR presser. I'm going to do some stuff here in the States. Um, but it, those are the types of things that, you know, you just got to worry that you really just have to think about um, when you're trying to, to do some stuff. Um, one more thing here. Look, you, you, if you're thinking about exporting, and this is in another seminar as well, you're going to have to have your team in place um, because it's not just about you. You're going to have to have a team of people who support you, whether your team is another one or a dozen. Um, to help you get a deal over the goal line to get a quality transaction done. And your reputation is at stake every step of the way. Uh, for me, unfortunately, um, sometimes I have to make more than one trip um, and have a lot of frequent face-to-face. -face. Yes, I use Zoom. Yes, I use WhatsApp. Yes, I use FaceTime. But sometimes if you feel like your deal's in jeopardy, or it's taken too long, then you're going to have to pack your bags and go wherever it is you need to go to get the deal over the goal line. Um, uh, if, especially if you're the tip of the spear and the one that needs to get the, uh, to get the deal done for your organization. Uh, let me go back one. Sorry about that. Hey, hey Sam, I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, so in Thailand, I've got a guy, he's going to be an intern with us that's going to be working on an account that he used to buy from us. They got about 160 stores over around Thailand. And uh, I was going to have him call him because he can speak their language, start emailing and call him. I mean, do you think that's a good way to kickstart that again? Heck yeah. And if he obviously if he can speak their language, but then, and then if, but if he's not going to be here, permanently, if he's kind of an intern, I'll need to kind of start sitting in to kind of establish that relationship with him too. You're going to have to be there since day one. Right. Okay. Right. So he, you can always introduce somebody as your associate. Right. Uh, I wouldn't tell him he's an intern, um, but, you know, he's here. This is what he does. Hey, fortunately, he speaks Thai. Um, so, you know, he can he can help you. Hopefully you're dealing with people that speak English. But, yeah, I'd have him. I'd have him there. And you might even, as a cool thing for an intern, if you're going over there, take them with you, mm -hmm. right? Just take them with you. Right. And all that stuff um, actually, you know, increases your level of credibility that, oh my gosh, you got somebody on your team that speaks Thai uh, and understands the language and the culture. That's a huge bonus. Okay. okay. Right. Awesome. Um, on this leveraging the website, I'll go two things for you on this. Um Two things I've done. My brand book that I have is much better than my website. So I have put together a brand book for Slim Chickens. It is a PowerPoint. It is, um, I have a lot of video content um, that really expresses the essence of my brand. Uh, I spend a lot of money on it. Uh, we pull a lot of content. I do a lot of PR with Slim Chickens domestically and internationally. And I put all that stuff in there to tell the story uh, of 
of how cool my restaurants are and, and how our businesses act. And that stuff really blows people away, especially when I'm on my first or second call. And then I send them that brand book because uh, I was talking about this the other day. I was dealing with a guy who was like number three or four down the run. And I call him, I go, he's the scout. So he's just out there. They sent him out there as the scout to sniff out some brands um, before they kick it upstairs to the other guys um, uh, who are decision makers. And when I when I go up another level within the organization and I hit him with that brand book um, and they're all sitting around a table or whatever it is that they do and they look at some of my material, um, usually within a week or two, I get a call going, hey, we'd like to have another call with you. Um, and then next thing you know, I'm moving up the ladder to decision makers uh, and people that want to, you know, the, the, the people that can make actually make something happen. But your website should have a lot of the stuff that you're doing, what your products are. That's kind of table stakes. Um, but it all, in featuring your products and services. But then anytime you're starting to do international stuff, load it in. Um, because, and you can even have another section in your website that says international. Um, so people kind of get a, a sense of where you're at and what you're doing and shamelessly promote yourself, uh, with all the stuff that you do, uh, domestically and internationally as well. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to pause here, uh, and I'm going to open it up. Uh, to any questions, I see one on the chat. Uh, so on this uh, question that Randy has, if, if I understand it correctly, uh, there are or in international attorney organizations. Uh, one is called WILL, W-I-L-L. -L, and uh, I, I'm part of a global consortium of market entry consultants. And WILL is kind of a sister organization. There's uh, international attorneys from all over the world, and they deal strictly with international transaction sorts of issues. So there are, in fact, organizations out there of international attorneys. We also happen to have in the District of Sport Council uh, a very good international attorney, a Graham Catbutt, uh, that can help as well. But uh, in any case, do, as uh, as Sam was saying, do make sure that you uh, um, get uh, an international attorney, not just, not just any old attorney. And it's going to be also really important for that attorney to have relationships uh, uh, with a, uh, there's a, a word for it, but basically somebody said that that, it, that they collaborate with in that other country that you're doing business with. Um, you know, just having somebody just over there, and, and I'll just use Dubai strictly as an example. Just having an attorney in Dubai by itself is 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 I don't I don't think enough. You have to have an attorney here and there that that can talk to each other and make sure that everything goes smoothly. Do you yeah. agree with that, uh, Sam? Yeah, I do. And uh, sometimes, you know, like I said, I, I have some brokers that I do business with um, that introduce me to people and uh, they have attorneys that they recommend to me and I vet them. But yeah, if you have a U.S. attorney, um, but then you can get some, and it saves you a fortune um, when you can find a good local attorney because they can cut right through it. Um, when you're trying to just be a U.S. attorney going back and forth, one, the billable hours go up. <laughs> uh, two, I typically negotiate uh, the fee. So I'll say, hey, look, this is this is what I'm trying to do. Here's here, here's how I think this thing is going to go. Um, obviously, these attorneys understand either trademark law, which trademark is a whole different thing, um, but they also understand franchising contract law. And I'll say, look, I need to do this, this, and this. What do you think? And, you know, somebody will go, well, that's 10 grand, 15 grand, 25 grand, 50 grand, depending on the complexity of the law. What I try to do is cut off the billable hours um, because in, 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 uh, because the attorneys start going round and round. And then also one of the things I'll tell you, you as the business owner or the person in charge of it, you're the one at the end of the day has to call a timeout <laughs> or you just say, this is my agreement. 
this is what we're going to do. You guys need to cut your bullshit and you need to get this deal done. Uh, if not, they just start arguing over words at, you know, $500 an hour or whatever it is that they're charging. If you're lucky. <laughs> if, if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, so it, it's critical. Yeah. And, and Sam, uh, you, you may have a, a different take on this, but, you know, I like to use specialist attorneys because, you know, I mean, and I'm just being silly here. I mean, you know, what's a divorce attorney know about about trademarks, you know? Uh, and so even though their per hour rate may be higher, you know, you're not going to be paying an attorney to learn about trademarks, right? Or, or X, mm -hmm. uh, franchise law. And so getting somebody who's a specialist in the specific area that you're trying to, you know, to do a contract on is going to be much cheaper in the long run, especially if you take Sam's tactic as well. Yeah. So trade, let's go into trademarks for a minute since it was brought up. Um, I have spent a lot of time and money over the last three years trademarking Slim Chickens through Asia, Mideast. Good news is the EU is only one filing and it covers all those countries. Um, and then uh, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, I, I've, I'm pretty much trademarked up. The good news is there are some great attorneys in the U.S. or law firms that can trademark your stuff all over the world. Um, so you don't have to find an attorney um, in uh, Dubai or you have to find one in South Korea or wherever it is you want to go. Um, there are great U.S. firms that can do all that work for you if you find somebody that understands international trademark law. Yeah, yeah and Sam, is it, your, uh, is it your sense that they have this collaborative relationships with guys in Dubai, wherever uh, mm -hmm. and and that's and that's what makes them so effective yeah on the trademark stuff yes sir yeah yeah absolutely and then there's some there's some kind of coordination of some countries where you can go in and you can swipe a whole bunch of countries at one time yes sir um, so yeah they, they know these guys this is what these people do for a living i actually just moved my trademark um uh law from one firm to another because the one firm they were just killing me on fees and they finally aggravated me enough to move to another firm that's been doing it for about 75 years and they know how to cut through it um but yeah i mean proven track record interview them get some references on them but you got to trademark yourself up uh, i'll just you know truth be told um i had three different countries uh where slim chickens was trademarked somebody stole my mark um, and two of them, I was able to get back and one I'm not currently, I'm going to have to wait a couple of years to see whether or not the person who trademarked it is actually going to use it mm -hmm. because in a lot of countries you can register a trademark and then the country has this, um, non-use provision. Some of them are three years, four years, five years. If somebody hasn't used the mark, then you can go ahead and pull it away from them. Uh, or you can petition to have the mark removed. But yeah, I had to go. I, one good example, this guy uh, registered my mark in Canada about four months before I went to register it. Mm. And um, I was able to buy it back from him. Um, and it, it wasn't bad, but I was surprised. Uh, and this guy had been registering marks from all kinds of food service businesses in the U.S. and some bigger brands than mine. Um, but if you think you're going to start doing business, uh, in some of these other countries, part of your setup is you got to go register your trademarks. Um, so you, you know, you have yourself clamped down um, yeah. and it's not, a ton, it's not a ton of money, um, but you know, you to register a mark, Rudy, four, five, six grand, uh, depending on the country. And then I have to register two marks. I register my logo and then I register slim chickens and then I have to register it all together and then in some countries, like in the Middle East, you have to register it in English and in Arabic. Um, so then, you know, you get double tapped. Um, yeah. Translation so, services and on and on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it's the price of doing business and you have to gear up your organization to be able to want to do that. But somebody in your organization has to understand this is part of getting prepared uh, but that's a whole nother series. So I'm sorry I dove into that. We got, we got into that, Rudy. No, no worries. I think it was great information. Uh, I don't see any other questions, but uh, let's just open it up for questions at this point then.
Wow. Nobody, huh? Sam, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. How do you have some of those difficult conversations about, you know, what, what types of goals do they need to have to be successful? And, 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 uh, you know, how long of a, is there, is there a length of time that you have to have a contract with them? That's according to the local laws there that, that, uh, require you to do certain things for them that, that, uh, if you have to exit, uh, do you have a better way of getting around some of those things? Yeah. So for me, my contracts are usually 10 or 15 years um, for opening a restaurant. So it's a little different than maybe trying to sell some other product. Um, you know, is your question really about how do you unwind it? Uh, if it doesn't go well? Yeah, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you, you have certain, milestones that they need to meet that you don't expect them to, you know, do $2 million worth of business in, in a year or anything like that. But, uh, but are there's those milestones and how do you, un, you know, if you have to unwind that, do you, are you hard and firm with that or do you mm. make adjustments to help them go on? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, the milestones are opening restaurants on a timeline, right? So let's say we give them, I do, let's say I do a 15 restaurant deal and they say they're going to open them in eight years and we have milestones as to, you know, by the end of, by the first quarter of 2026, you need to have your first restaurant open. And then every year after that, you need to have a, a new restaurant open. Um, there's kind of three types of developers. There are people who are aggressive and get ahead of it. There's, there's one group that stays on pace, actually four, there's one that lag behind and then there's four that just stop. Right, they're done. Um, either the business isn't working for them, they ran out of capital, whatever the case may be. When they're slow in developing, but they're trying, then I am very, uh, usually very agreeable and I will redo their development timeline. Maybe they're running into economic issues, maybe they're running into some government issues, maybe there's a slight, um, you know, when you get into this stuff, you think you know everything going in, and then reality kind of, kind of pops up maybe a year or two or three later, and then you're like, okay, let's just deal with the reality of what's going on. But you know, when the business isn't going well, then you just have to deal with it. I'll give you an example. Um, I was in Kuwait. We opened a restaurant in Kuwait, very large conglomerate. We put a Slim Chickens there. We chose the wrong location. We didn't set the business up right. The franchisee had two other restaurant concepts, U.S. restaurant, well, one U.S. restaurant concept, one U.K. restaurant concept, and it just wasn't going well. They opened the second location in an airport, and then COVID hit like a week later, so the airport was shut down. Um, but they really, they, we were years into it, and they really, I could tell they weren't enthusiastic because it wasn't working because that first location and we didn't have a really good market entry strategy. Uh, and so it just wasn't working. So I just, you know, we just talked to each other and I go, look, this isn't working for you. Um, it's not working for me. Uh, why don't we just agree to dissolve it? And, you know, it was a very simple two page agreement that says we're done. <laughs> um, we'll shake hands. We'll, we'll, um, we'll uh, choose to not sue each other. And, you know, all was well. And uh, next time I'm through the region, maybe I'll buy you dinner. Yeah. Um, so it usually comes to some kind of mutual agreement. Uh, if people want to play hard and fast, then you're going to have to figure out, you know, how to do it. Um, at the end of the day, I always have this other attitude, Randy. Uh, it's like, OK, if I get a divorce from you or I'm not being flexible, it's not like somebody else is going to run into that country and start doing business right away. So are you willing to limp along and get things continued to the move? Or do you really have somebody else can go in there and um, take over and still get and still get you to, you know, the sales and revenue that you're trying to achieve? You know, you, you mentioned something I thought was really kind of interesting. And, and, and that is uh, something that I hadn't even thought about on franchises is, is different franchises types from different countries. And mm -hmm. uh, I bet that becomes a whole, learning experience by itself. Uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting.
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my so, pleasure. Yeah, one of the other things that uh, we we've kind of uh, talked around, but I I, I want to be a little bit more direct, and that is uh, that it's really important to understand the laws of, of each country that you're doing business with. Yeah, you know, in, in once again we 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 go into deals in in uh, internationally with U.S you know, eyes thinking that everything works uh, like, like it does in the United States or very, very similar. And that's just, that's just not the case. I mean, you know, here, here in the United States, uh, you know, if, if we have an employee and, and for whatever reason, we don't, uh, we don't want him working for us anymore. I mean, we just fire him and that's just it. That That's just not the case in many, many countries. And it's also not the case in terms of contracts with like uh, distributors, just as an example, uh, you know, in some in some countries, it is extremely difficult to end a contract with a distributor. Uh, and so, once again, know the countries of the laws, get a good attorney, good attorneys to be able to help you through all that, because it's not just a matter of saying, "Hey, uh, you know, let's let's call it quits." It, it may not be uh, that easy. Uh, also, I uh, uh, Miss Miss Heidi. Uh, put up kind of a list of, of uh, questions that are often asked. And and one of the questions has to do with, you know, you bringing gifts uh, to meetings and whatnot. And I've got this kind of cool book. It's called uh, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands, uh, How to Do Business in 60 Countries. It might be a good primer to, to, to read something like this to see, you know, if you're doing, if you're going to the Czech Republic, you know, what are some things that you should know about the Czech Republic uh, in terms of cult culture orientation? And so there are definitely resources out there that you can use to find out, you know, the, the things that you would, what mistakes that you don't want to make, uh, you know, in, in different countries, uh, even in terms of gifts, uh, you know, obviously that's always welcome, but it, it could be that you give a gift in the wrong color and it might have uh, a connotation of death for instance uh you know colors that that would not mean anything to us like white in other countries it it stands for death and so <laughs> you know obviously you don't want to kill kill the the deal right off the bat so in knowing these uh this nuances cultural nuances uh to start up the relationship is really important yeah it's interesting really so um in China, so the Slim Chicken's logo is black, right? The bird is black. Tried to trademark it with the word Slim Chickens, and they rejected it um, <laughs> because the bird was black, which means death. That's so right. So basically, and I was kind of angry with my trademark attorney, who's a Chinese guy, who lives in China, who was referred to me, and. He goes, yeah, you got rejected because it was the black bird of death. I was like, well, thanks for trying to register it. So then I registered it red. I just, which red is a happy color. Red is the color of China. It got yeah. approved immediately. Yeah. Yeah. You would so, think he would have told you that, right? Yeah. I was kind of angry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, Limp Chickens, we, we tried to register well, actually, this is my second attorney because the first one, you know, I had to fire because of this stuff. The two characters that they used uh, along with it in Chinese was a derogatory um, mm. uh, against women. It was bad. It was like bad word towards women when separately the, the characters were fine. And then when you put it together, it meant something pretty bad. Um, so obviously... Uh, we put together new characters that kind of phonetically spelled out as it, it's kind of slur chicken, uh, <laughs> but it, it kind of gets there. You're never going to get one for one, but these are the types of things. Rudy's right. It's like, I'd have never thought that, you know, a black bird in, in China was like, yeah, that's the bird of death. And, and uh, we're not going to approve that. So yeah, it's easy to turn it red. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I always tell my my clients and my and my students is that in terms of international business, you should assume that it's different. Whatever it is we're talking about, uh, start off with the assumption that it's done differently in X country, and you're probably usually going to be right, and and you're probably less likely to get into trouble if you start off with the assumption that it is different than it is in the United States. And then vet your groups. 
vet them like they're vetting you but do some background homework on these mm-hmm. people because you, you don't always you can put a nice face on on it but you know check these people out absolutely yeah. well uh i don't think that we see, uh i don't think we have any more questions at this point uh, but uh this has been i, I think a, a great um uh, webinar on on developing relationships and how how you have to you know ease into it and understand the cultural nuances and why uh, in other countries things go a lot lot slower and once again it's, it has to do mostly with the legal system or the lack of a legal system uh, in other countries versus uh, let's say the the U.S. Uh, here is our contact information if you have questions of Sam or me or, or anybody else. Feel free to contact us and uh, re- reach out with any, any any questions that you might have, and we'll be uh, do the best that we can. Now, uh, Ms. Heidi, is there a survey questionnaire this time oh, around? Sure. Yeah, you know, obviously the the only way that we know whether we're we're hitting the mark here in terms of the the information that we're providing to you is to ask you how are we doing and so please feel free to to comment uh and if we can make improvements please tell us how how we can do that we're here for for you guys yes also please note that you have to register for every class that you want to attend so yeah. please go ahead and register if you want to come next week uh to the class about international logistics Colton right. works for V. Alexander out of uh, Memphis, and I'm sure he's going to be a good speaker, too. Yeah, yeah, he'll be great. And uh, I think you guys know there's a total of five classes in this series co- called Grow, uh, Grow Your Exports. And so uh, we're going to have uh, the logistics uh, the next week and the week after that. I think it's uh, contracts, right? International contracts. Is that correct, Ms. Heidi? Yes. Graham Catlett's. Um, yes. Absolutely, yeah. and, and so do, do. Bring, yeah. Bring your bring your questions about legal issues. Yeah, and and uh, do do remember to go ahead and, and register uh, if you want to attend those classes. But uh, if you would be so kind as to fill out the survey, would be most appreciative. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sam. And yeah, uh, with you. with that, I think uh, we will call it a day, and hopefully, we'll see you all next week. Alrighty. Thank you all.